In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, you don't have to go there because I'm going to read those verses and go to other passages pretty quick, and we're going to kind of, you know, uh, leap from that as kind of a starting point, just kind of a th- more of a theme uh, to talk about, you know, what we're to be doing in these days in which we live and how we're to be prepared for the Lord and prepared to die. You know, the scriptures tell us in Amos chapter 4.12, uh, God speaks to Israel and he says, prepare to meet your God. Prepare to meet your God. Did you, you realize that we're all going to stand before God and you're going to stand before him either prepared or unprepared, amen? Which would you rather be? Especially when the scriptures say that God is a consuming fire, it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That's if you're his adversary. You're not walking with him. You're in rebellion to him. James 4.4 4 says, You adulteresses, know you not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever makes himself a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And in Hebrews chapter 10, it warns what happens to the enemies of God. It, it says, If we go on sinning woefully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but only a fearful looking for a fiery indignation which will consume the adversaries of God. That's pretty scary. Uh, we want to be right with God, Amen. And we are right with God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done for us on the cross and paying for our sins, amen? Through trusting him, through being his disciples, followers of Christ, amen? So we want to make sure we're right with God. In the debate that I have coming up a week from today uh, with Doug Stoffer over in Colorado, uh, the last 15 minutes that we each will do will be on why we believe our view is important to prepare the church, why we believe the other view could be detrimental. And of course, I come from the historical pre-millennial, not pre-trib, pre-millennial, post-trib perspective, which was a position of the early church. And as I've told you many times, uh, there's no debate pre- or post-trib rapture in the early centuries of church history, or there's no debate on it even for the first 1,800 years of church history because there's only one view in regard to uh, Christ coming back in regard to uh, the tribulation period, uh, or it's at the end of the world. There's no pre-trib debate going on. So uh, I'm going to give my view, and he'll give his view, and I'm going to encourage you because that last 15 minutes, I've kind of developed into a message here. And a very important message. In fact, it's not going to be 15 minutes, though. It's going to be about normal time, maybe a tad shorter, that we'll be prepared. Amen? And why this is important. And it's, it's very important. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, says, There is an appointed time for everything, and there's a time for every event under heaven, a time to give birth and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted. There's a time for us to be born into the world. There's also a time that each of us are going to die. We each have an expiration date, you know? You ever go in, drink some uh, milk, or get some yogurt out of the fridge, and you don't check the expiration date, and you just about, you know, spit it up, or do spit it up? Because it just tastes so gross, like, because... The expiration dates come. Well, we all have an expiration date. And unless the Lord reveals to you that very specific time that you're going to die, it's going to come at a time that you're not going to know. And many people die suddenly. In Moore Park, it's been in the news lately because uh, there was a charge of a misdemeanor when the prosecutors think, or I should say, The recommendation by law enforcement was that it should be a felony because a gal was, they believe, looking at her cell phone. They charged with a misdemeanor because they can't prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt because she said, oh, no, I was going for my insulin insulin pump. I don't know the truth. Either way, she was distracted. God help us all to not be distracted, not wise to text when you're driving. Uh, And she swerved over, and she hit a guy on a bike and killed him. Then she swerved in the next lane to overcorrect uh, uh, incoming traffic. It hit a guy on a motorcycle and killed him. And that happened not, just not too long ago, uh, just a month, couple months ago or so. And uh, we don't know when we're going to die. That guy on the motorcycle, he had won many races, racing, quads. The guy on the bike just thought, hey, I'm just going for a ride. Yeah, people see me, or hopefully they see me. 
And they, that was both of their last rides. In fact, the guy on the motorcycle probably saw what happened, like, whoa, look at that, whoa, whoa, boom, he's gone. We've got to make sure we're right with God. You don't know when you're going to die. In fact, I don't know if you heard the news this morning, CNN headlines, uh, on, when I was uh, on the internet checking out the news as well this morning, I got to bed, I think I emailed Tony and Chad around 3, 3.30 in the morning, and then I woke up to finish my message a few hours later, and I thought, oh, do I have time to check out what's going on in the world? Because sometimes it's relevant to my message, and it is. Because the headline was, deadliest mass shooting in U.S. history in Orlando, Florida this morning. Okay? Uh, and then the next part of the headline, morning hours. The next part of the headline, <laughs> Fox News. Breaking news, 50 murdered. 53 wounded in possible act of Islamic terror in Orlando Gay Club. Gunmen killed by cops. Shooter ID'd as Omar Mateen, 29, a U.S. citizen with Afghan ties. And uh, he was a security guard there. Guy that's supposed to be protecting them. Just filled with evil. Uh, and all these folks that got killed, well, now they go into their eternal destiny. Were they ready? You know what the scriptures say. It's heartbreaking, actually. In, in, in many, many, many ways. So, we need to know what the scriptures say about our meeting the Lord. Now, the scriptures talk about how we're either going to see him or, or meet up with his verdict as far as uh, when you die, to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord, or you go to Hades, place of torment, to await the final judgment where you're sent ultimately uh, to the lake of fire. If your name's not written in the last book of life. Now, if you die, the Bible says the dead in Christ will, ri will rise first. But those of us who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. There'll be others who are alive when he comes, and the resurrection will happen just after the dead in Christ rise. So we're supposed to be ready for two things. We're supposed to be prepared to die. The psalmist talked about, Lord, tell me, show me how to you know, count my days so I can present to you a, 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 a right heart so he'd be ready for his death. We see that over and over again in the scripture, that the death, our death is given as an incentive to live a holy life before the Lord, make sure our faith is in Christ. In fact, Ecclesiastes that we started off with goes on to talk about how it's better to go to funerals than it is to parties, and we'll talk about that in another study as we work our way through that chapter. It's an incredibly heavy chapter we're going through in Ecclesiastes. And he says it's better to go to funerals because you ponder your death and you're wise. I'm sorry, to funerals, not parties, because parties, ha, you might feel good, have a good time, but it's not going to really help you much regarding your perspective on eternity and making sure you're right with God, not that God can't use those situations as long as it's a healthy, holy party. But we're supposed to consider our death, and it should weigh upon us. You're wise if you realize a funeral is good for your own purification. But also looking forward to Christ's return and looking for the signs that herald his return. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, that he, has, he who has this hope, Speaking of Christ's return, purifies himself even as he is pure. Because we're waiting for our bridegroom as the bride of Christ, amen? And as a bride prepares herself for the wedding and spends uh, a, a considerable amount of time getting ready for that wedding and making sure her dress is spotless and, and that she's ready and, and hopefully that her heart is, is right and that she is into it, uh, even so the church is called to keep its garments and and to remain unspotted by the world and, and to be ready for that time. Now, death can be imminent for any one of us. The second coming isn't any moment imminency. Jesus gave signs that would lead up to his second coming. In fact, some say, oh no, uh, it could come at any moment and so forth. And we know that that's so unscriptural. No, Peter and, and Paul and these guys taught it could happen any time. They, they, they would, could be there and get raptured. No, they didn't believe that. Paul said, don't be deceived. He said that the falling away would come in the Antichrist first, amen? In fact, Peter didn't believe the Lord was gonna come back from any moment because Jesus, according to John chapter 21, verses 18 and 19, told Peter that he would grow old and that he would die as a martyr. Remember that? 
So if Jesus would have come before Peter grew, grew old and died as a martyr, because it says he told him the way he'd glorify him in his death, if Jesus would have come before that and Peter wouldn't have died, then Jesus would have been what? A false prophet. That's not going to happen. Okay? So Peter knew. Paul also, the Lord showed him how much he would suffer. He showed him that he would go to Rome eventually in his ministry. He, he also said, uh, showed Paul that he would die, and Paul said that he would be poured out as a drink offering, and he's in prison there in 2 Timothy 4 talking about that, and how I, he says, I have fought the good fight. I have uh, finished my course. I have kept the faith. Therefore, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Uh, uh, talking about the Lord's return, and not for me only, but for all those who love his appearing. Paul had the blessed hope. So did Peter. Even though they didn't believe that they could be raptured at any moment, they both knew they would die before the rapture. We all have the blessed hope, even though we look for the signs that Jesus gave. So we prepare our hearts for his return, amen? That's why we call this fellowship Blessed Hope Chapel. The blessed hope isn't that we don't have to go through suffering. Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. The blessed hope is the fact that we get to be with Jesus, who is our hope, and we get to be with him forever when he comes, amen? It's all about Jesus and being with him. So this is important that we understand it, that we are prepared, and that we look at the roadmap that God has for us. I learned really young, and then a little bit later, how important roadmaps are. I used to have a job where I did have to work in the mountains and dig ditches and test pits and so forth, and, and I, Thomas Guide was like one of my best friends. I had my Bible and I had my Thomas Guide, okay? Because you could locate where you're going. It's pretty easy before they had the GPS thing going on the cars and so forth, the navigators, which kind of make you dumb with maps, tell you the truth. Uh, and I was grateful for it. But I was hiking from Fillmore up toward Lake Pyramid, but not all the way, just part way with, with my wife one time before we were married, actually, uh, going with, I think, a brother named Willie Espinosa. We were going backpacking. And a couple brothers were coming downhill, down the mountain, down from Lake Pyramid. They were dropped off up there, and they said, hey, they've taken, a, a, I don't know, they took two or three days to do it, but they said, you could do it in a day if you just hike straight through. All the way from Lake Pyramid, you have someone drop you off, and you just go and do it in a day. I was like, wow, that sounds really cool. They just told me a day. Another brother said, yeah, I think it's only like five, six miles as the crow flies. I'm like, oh, that's a piece of cake. I didn't look at the map. I got two references. Didn't look at the map, thought, no big deal. Jim McFaul lives in uh, Ventura now. Great bro. Uh, Kenny, I asked those guys if they wanted to go backpacking. Get dropped off by my wife early in the morning. We could do it in a day, but you know what? We'll do it overnight so I have two days we can relax. We can fish on the way. We can jump off rocks into the water pools. It's going to be awesome. Kenny was like, I've never gone packing, backpacking. I do not want to go backpacking. I kind of howled at him a little bit, and he kind of, like, man, Kenny, you're part Indian, man. It's in your blood, you know. And Kenny finally said, you know what? He acquiesced. Yeah, okay, I'll go. He got excited about it. Jim was excited about it. We start backpacking. We start our way down early in the morning. It's freezing cold out, so I put jeans on, right? And man, when that sun came out about 10 a.m., came out earlier, but when it started starting to beam a little bit hotter and you got this big backpack, 11, you know, whatever time it was, it started getting really hot. And I was like, man, I didn't bring any shorts. I don't want to backpack in my underwear, of course. And all of a sudden we came across these couple of these Arabic guys, I assume they were Muslims, and they were in a, in, they were fishing, because we're going through, we're going through the canyons is what we're doing, going down a huge canyon, guys, and with walls and so forth, and Huge mountain walls. Beautiful, beautiful hike. And they're in there, and they're in waders, you know. And, uh, you know, there's, those are those pants that help you from getting wet, you know. Go all the way up, like, huge overalls, plastic material. And we're trying to talk to them a little bit because they're in the water deep fishing. And we know they're trying to fish. And then we cruise a little while, and I'm like, man, I should have brought some shorts. I wasn't prepared, but, hey, I'm okay. I'll, I'll get through it. I'll hike in my boxers in case, you know, you see some people and whatever. But then all of a sudden, guess what, man? Down the trail a little bit, there's two pairs of shorts just on the side sitting on these bushes. 
I'm like, what's the odds of that? Jim McFall's like, man, that's a gift from the Lord. So one's like, doesn't have a little, one has a little belt thing. It's kind of big. I was thinner then, you know. And one is a little bit too long. So I take the belt off the one because it's like those, you know, remember the older, uh, the older uh, running, you know, sweats, took the lace out, stuck them on the other one, cut the pants off. These ones went down to your knees. I cut them nice and short. And we're all like, wow, what a trip. Until we go down a couple more hours and we're sitting there and now we're just lot, way down the mountain. And Jim goes, those Muslim guys. I go, yeah. He goes, I think that was probably their shorts. And I'm like, I could see those guys, hopefully they had underwear on, you know, walking back up without the uh, shorts on. And that trip started kind of gnarly. <laughs> it's like, that was before 9-11, so I felt, didn't feel as threatened, you know. So anyway, uh, we continued to cruise. We had no idea how long this trip was going to be. And we just kept going and going. But we thought we could get there in less than a day. They thought that because I communicated that to them. They were cruising at a pretty decent pace still. And you know what? I was supposed to, my, so we spent the night, fish, great time. Started to go the next day. My wife's going to meet us down in the Fillmore area. Uh, what's that lake over there? Pyru Lake. He's going to meet us at Pyru Lake. And we're cruising. That's where I backpack up from. I know that territory. I just never went as high as Pyramid. And we're hiking and hiking all of a sudden. You ever see a cartoon, and especially with the old graphics they'd use, you just see the same mountain over and over again as they're going because they don't want to put the time into making all these different mountains look different? That's how it was. You'd see a mountain in front of you, your canyon's headed toward it, you go around it, because I know it would flatten out before Peru. I know that, I know when I hit that, I'd always be like, praise God, we're getting close. But this was way up there. And every time I saw a mountain, went around the other mountain, there's another mountain way up there. And it happened over and over and over again. We already stayed overnight, I was supposed to meet my wife, and I was supposed to get there that day. It's Saturday because I preached the next morning, Sunday morning. And we just kept going and going. And it didn't end. And it was starting to get dark. That would be the second night. So I'm like, my wife's probably freaking out. Where are they? And <laughs> Jim and Kenny... You know, they're debating over who could have the gun because there's these big bear poops everywhere. And, and they're like thinking about, and then, you know, Kenny, it's his first time really doing that. Kenny's a pretty tough guy, but he just not used to being out in the wild at that time. He got boot camp, man, quick. Because I'm outside in my, you know, Jim's in his little tent with his dog and his gun. I've got my dog, but it's with Kenny and I. And every time I'd wake up two, three, four in the morning, Kenny's up sitting up. Did you hear that? Because <laughs> you're hearing movements in the, in the stuff. And I'm like, I'm hearing it, but I'm thinking, okay, it's probably just little animals and stuff. And then he's like, Jim, give me your gun or your dog. You don't need both, you know. And Jim's being like stubborn. No, they're mine. I'm like, oh, Lord, <laughs> you know. And I know, yeah, there's a bear there, and how it can only go so many ways. It's a big canyon. <laughs> there's a canyon that's pretty narrow at points. And I'm like, and then we're going again the next day. It's the third day. We're supposed to only not be there another day. We're supposed to be gone the day before. And my dog won't walk anymore. Even my dog's upset with me. You know, bloody paws, okay? And I had to put her on my backpack. She's like a 55, 60-pound dog, and so I'm carrying her. And I look back at, at Kenny and Jim, and I was sure, man, because they're like back, and I'm like, I felt terrible what I did to these guys, man. And I thought, man, the love of many is growing cold right now toward me. <laughs> Kenny said, no, nah, he was cool, but, you know, they were both like, well, we should have checked the map. It's our fault, too. I'm like, no, nah, it's on me, because I told you, and a couple guys told me, and we just relayed the wrong message. They didn't know there would be tribulation. <laughs> that much tri trials and tribulation, you know? And even when we camped that night, it was like, remember, Kenny, we couldn't, couldn't find a place to, uh, it was so narrow. That's, uh, you're, it's only creek, and two sides going up, and one going up where you could possibly find a nook, hopefully. So we said, man, we got to stop. It's dark. We can't get, we kept going in the dark. But I'm like, I got to get home and preach by Sunday. 
So we actually literally walked up these crags and found little spots to sleep in. Hopefully you fall asleep. Hopefully you don't turn over because you roll right down the mountain into the creek, you know. So it was pretty gnarly. And there was a lot of things that went on. I mean, that was one, my best trip ever, by the way, Kenny. Now that I think back about it, you know. <laughs> uh, and, and I could tell, I could see the part Indian coming out of Kenny, man, because all of his senses were like, Phew. if you ever drive with Kenny or go somewhere with Kenny, he's, in, he's incredibly good with directions. I mean, it blows me away because I used to work with Kenny. But at this point, he's like, man, I should have looked at the map. Because <laughs> he's relying on me. And it just got, there were so many incredible things about that trip. And the Sunday morning, I'm hoofing it. They're like, you're going to miss preaching anyway. Let's just take our time. I'm like, no, I got to go. Just in case. And I keep going. And we're still not seeing that opening. Still not seeing that opening. Finally, there's an expanse of an opening. I know that's another few miles at that point. It just so happens that search and rescue is doing a trial out there. And they see us. And my wife had given it a call. And uh, she said, you think they're lost? She goes, I don't know that they're lost because I know, think they know what they're doing. They're just following the canyon down. But they're really late. They didn't make it yesterday. And they just kept an eye open for us. And praise God. We got raptured right at that point at the end, you know. And uh, they gave us a ride. My wife raced home. I went into the bathroom. I didn't have time to take a shower. I shaved real quick, slicked my hair back, put a vest on. I used to wear a vest more often. <laughs> Boom, I walk in on time for church. Every, no one has a clue what happened, you know. My wife's like, what in the world? Kenny and Jim are like, we're going home. In fact, we don't know if we're ever coming back to Blessed Hope Chapel. <laughs> No, they didn't say the second part, but <laughs> sorry, Kenny. Apologize again for that, man. <laughs> but you know what? I had let them know that, hey, we're not going to be going through all that stuff. It's not going to be. And we're told by the guys, what did they say? They said, hey, because the trails were all messed up. There were boulders and everything. You had to walk through the creek a lot. They go, we don't even go up there that far anymore since the earthquake, because the 94 earthquake had happened. It's all messed up. It's thrash. It's hard to get through that area. It takes forever. I didn't know that. I didn't know. I didn't think we'd go through the earthquakes and all the things that the scriptures mention, so to speak, you know? And it was a trip because when we went through this, I think they said it was like a 25-mile trip. Six miles? No. It's about 25. I don't even know if it's that long, but that's what they told us when we were driving back. Isn't that about right? Yeah, 25. There's an amen over there from Kenny. Still loves me, you know? Uh, <laughs> Anyway, guys, what I'm telling you right now is you have to look at the map. We have to be prepared and go to Matthew chapter 24 because the apostles asked Jesus in verse 4 we read, in verse 3 we read, and he was sitting on the Mount of Olives and the disciples came to him privately. That would be Peter, James, John, and Andrew who were the apostles became the apostles of the early church. These are the guys asking him, saying, tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming? And of what? The end of the age. What's the sign of your coming and the end of the age? When will these things happen? The destruction of the temple. Luke 21, verses uh, 12 through 24, talks about what would happen uh, before the destruction of the temple and the destruction of the temple. Matthew 24 has more to do with uh, what would happen with regard to the birth pains and the end times when they come. And in verse 4, Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. Jesus warns over and over and over again about spiritual deception in the last days, guys. Be very, very careful. Very, very careful. Because Jesus gave two long messages right before he died to prepare the church. He gave... The Olivet Discourse, which is his longest message, if you put Matthew 24 and 25 with Mark 13 and Luke 21 and put all the verses together that don't overlap each other, it's the longest message he ever gave. To prepare them, to give them a road map into the coming tribulation and how to endure it. And then a couple days later, the day before he died, he gave the Upper Room Discourse where he talked to them about prepare them even more regarding the coming of the Holy Spirit who would bring all things in remembrance for the church. He's warning the church what it's going to be like in the future. 
And then in verse 33, he says, in the world you have tribulation, but take courage or be of good cheer, as the King James says, for I have overcome the world. In chapter 15, he talked about how he's the vine and we're the branches that we're supposed to abide in him. And then in verse 18, he says, if they persecuted me, the master, he goes, the world's going to hate you. If they persecuted me, which they're going to crucify him the next day. How much more are they going to hate you, the servants? And then in John chapter 16, verses 1 through 4, he says, they're going to put you to death thinking that they're serving God. Because, you know, the Antichrist is going to claim to be God, right? And they're going to kill you. And he says, I'm telling you things. Now, this is important. Listen, guys. He says, I'm telling you these things in advance. So when it happens, you will not fall away. That's verses 1 through 4. They're going to kill you, thinking they're serving God. You're going to be killed. By the way, pretty much all the apostles were killed except for John. He only had to get stuck in hot oil and almost burned to death and then exiled in Patmos for the word of God. They're going to kill you. You're going to be persecuted. They're going to hate you even more than me. I'm telling you these things ahead of time. So when it happens, you will not what? Fall away. In other words, if Jesus did not prepare us for what's coming, what would happen to the church? They would what? They would fall away. Well, guess what? In Matthew chapter 24, he prepares them even more specifically for the tribulation period. And they, they ask him, what will, what will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And he tells them, watch out for these false Christs. That's going to be a big problem. In fact, look at verse 24. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the what? Even the elect. Look at verse 25. Behold, I have told you what? In advance. You see it? There it is again. Why is he telling us in advance? Why does he warn us about what's coming up in the coming tribulation events? So we won't what? So we won't fall away. In other words, if you aren't warned about the coming tribulation period, it happens. <laughs> it's going to make the trip from Lake Pyramid that Kenny and Jim and I took literally look like a stroll in the park. Amen, Kenny? When you think about the contrast, Kenny's going like this, mm, close. No, he's not. But you know, he tells us in advance. There it is again. Why? So we won't fall away. Back up to verse 6. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for those things must take place, but that is not yet what? The end. He doesn't want us to think the end is at the beginning. In fact, look at verse 7. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the what? The beginning of birth pains. There'll be birth pains all the way through, but this is the beginning of birth pains. He doesn't want you to think the beginning is really what? The ending. What is the church being taught today? The beginning is what for us? The end. In fact, uh, he says, When he says in verse 7, nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom, here's places, famines, and earthquakes, these are merely the uh, beginning of birth pains. He doesn't want them to be alarmed, okay? In fact, look at verse 6. You'll be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not, what? Frightened, alarmed. For those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. In other words, when it starts really heating up, and you think it's the end, it's not, so don't be frightened. It's not supposed to be the end for you. Do you understand? The Greek word there is throeo, T-H-R-O-E-O, throeo. And it means to be shocked, to be alarmed. Don't be alarmed. Why would they be alarmed? I think we know. Why would they think that's the end right there? And it's really disconcerting because there's the tribulation, there's the affliction, there's the threat of death, but there's also these false prophets. And Satan wants to confuse us as we enter in that time because that's when he wants to collect as many souls as he can. In fact, Paul used the same exact Greek word when he's talking about the same exact subject. Jesus first says in verse 15 that the abomination of desolation, the Antichrist, will come. And in verses 9 and 10, there'll be a falling away. 
Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, concerning Christ's coming, parousia, the same Greek word we have here, what will be the sign of your parousia and the end of the age, the suntelias to ionas, the end of the age. Paul says concerning Christ, parousia, and our gathering together unto him, gathering together, episunagoge, okay, episunago, Jesus and Paul use the same word, one uses the verb, one uses the, the noun, episunagoge and episunago, and they're both talking about the same gathering, they're both talking about the Lord's parousia to gather us up, and Jesus said it's not at the beginning, don't be alarmed, don't think it's then, Paul says this, see to it that none of you are shaken, in your mind, seismos, shaken out of your wits. Or, and then he adds, throw eo, alarmed. Don't let anyone deceive you, he says, either by word or spirit like a demon or letter as from us, counterfeit letter, or someone claiming that Paul was teaching a doctrine that he is not teaching. He says, let no one deceive you in any way. For that day, what day? Christ coming to what? Gather us together, the rapture. Let no one deceive you in any way, for the day of the Lord will not come, except there come a apostasia, a fallen away, first and, meaning second, next, the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition who sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Then it's not until verse 8. The lawless one will be revealed, the Antichrist, is going to sit in the temple. It says the lawless one will be revealed, and the Lord will destroy him with the spirit of his mouth and the brightness, the epiphania of his parousia. There it is. That's when Christ comes. If you just accept it for what it says, don't be deceived because when he's coming, parousia in our gathering, verse 8 happens right when he comes to destroy Antichrist. That's at the end of the tribulation, isn't it? And he says, don't be deceived because two things happen to have first. What? Fallen away and the Antichrist. What does Jesus talk about here? Same thing. Fallen away and the Antichrist first. In fact, let's pick it up. Verse 9. Then they will deliver you to what? Tribulation and will kill you. 24 9. They will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my what? My name. Now think about this. What's that verse saying? Look at it one more time. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and, you, and will kill you. And you will be hated by all nations because of my name. Don't think the end happens before that. That's not when his coming is. His end is later. Don't be alarmed when these things start to pick up. It's just the beginning. Don't freak out. Just like Paul said, don't be seismos, seismic, seismic is what we get. Don't have an earthquake in your brain. Don't be shaken out of your wits. As one translator translates it, I think F.F. Bruce don't be throw, uh oh, Paul said. It's not going to happen until the fallen away and the Antichrist is revealed first. Are you with me? That's why he tells us these things in what? Advance. So when it happens, we won't what? He says, we won't fall away. Well, look at the very next verse. At that time, many will what? Fall away. The same Greek word, scandalizo, that Paul uses in John chapter 16 when he says they're going to hand you over, where Jesus says they're going to hand you over to be killed. But I'm telling you advance, so when it happens, you won't fall away. Well, wait a minute. He says here, I'm telling you advance too. How is it in verse 10 that when they hand us over to tribulation, when the tribulation starts, that so many fall away if he told us in advance so we won't fall away? Think about it. Come on. It's a very easy question. How is it that Jesus tells us about the coming tribulation period and coming persecutions in general in advance so when they happen, we won't fall away. Yet when the tribulation starts, even though he gives a strong warning not to freak out at that time, many fall away anyway. Why? They're not listening to the warnings. They're not reading the map. They're being told that, hey, this map isn't for us. This is for unbelieving Jews that get converted during the tribulation period or, or Gentiles that get converted after the rapture. Where is that? In fact, in verse... 15, we read, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, it's the Antichrist, which was spoken through Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. Let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. 
Woe to the, uh, that whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get things out that are in his house. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babes in those days. But pray that your flight, who's your, who's he talking to? Peter, James, John, and Andrew. Because Jesus said no one knows the day and the hour when he's going to return. So they better be prepared in their own lifetime. Amen. Pray that your flight will not be made in the winter or on the Sabbath. In those days, if it happened in their time, man, on the Sabbath, and you're traveling on the Sabbath, you could be stoned to death. Even though I almost got stoned to death, believe it or not. I mean, I was with a couple brothers <laughs> witnessing Israel on Ben Yehuda Street, and an Orthodox Jew, and a bunch of them were chasing us. I had a whole ton of them that we were witnessing, and we were getting, we were just walking. We weren't running, but they were right on our tail, and two or three, three different police officers stopped to see what was going on and didn't stop it. They just kept a little bit on our tail, like 15 of them. And the Jewish evangelist I was with that worked, was the, running the Bible, American Bible Society bookstore there, he goes, I know where to go. Because we were preaching Jesus, man, and these Orthodox Jews have anti-missionary shirts, you know. And he goes, go this way. And we took off, and all of a sudden they stopped at the light and just watched us. One of them picked up a stone, a rock, a big rock, big piece of asphalt, actually, you know. The others, thankfully, said, hey, don't, 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 don't use that, you know. I go, man, how come they just stopped like they hit a brick wall right there? He goes, because we just entered into the Muslim quarter. I go, oh, never thought I'd be happy to be in the Muslim quarter. Okay. But he's talking about praying during that time. Praying that our, we would be able to be navigating, not just following his word, that's important, but also praying, right? Verse 21, for then there will be a what? Great tribulation such has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will be. So there'll be a falling away. Many will fall away, verse 10. The Antichrist will be revealed. The same order the apostle Paul gives concerning Christ coming and our being gathered together. That won't happen, he says, until what happens? The falling away and the Antichrist is the temple. Same exact order. It's plain as day. It's so clear. Yet they miss it. How could they miss it when it's just so clear? That shows me there is a spiritual deception afoot when most of the professing evangelical church misses it. In fact, one of the brothers I'm going to be speaking with at the conference, not the guy I'm debating, but another speaker, very well-known speaker, at another conference I was invited to speak at with Tony, which is pre-tribbers that invited us. Praise God, that was kind of them. But we're talking at the table to one of the guys that invited us, along with this very well-known gentleman who speaks in the prophet's circuit who's pre-trib. And when I mentioned 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and quoted it, he goes, you know what, Joe? Tony was there. <laughs> Tony knows exactly who I'm talking about. He goes, you know what, Joe, whenever I read that passage, I come to the same conclusion you do. Paul seems really clear right there. We're going to see Antichrist. But then I read my pre-trip commentaries, and they say, no, that's not really what it means. Brothers, there's a haze over the church right now, especially in America, where we're so not used to suffering, and we so have this instantaneous, you know, gratification, microwaves and fast food and all that stuff, and and we can take pain pills and all this stuff. We're not used to this. Well, look at verse 29. You know this verse, but immediately, what? After the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. After or before the tribulation? After the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. We will not give its light, and the power, stars will fall from the sky. The powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together. That's where you have that tie between Episunago and Episunagoge. His elect, as the elect of God, Colossians 3 says, to, talks about living for the Lord. How shall the enemy bring an accusation against God's elect? It's him who justifies. Romans chapter 8, I think verse 33. Make your call and election sure, 2 Peter chapter 1. They will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. Immediately when? After the tribulation. I don't know how much clearer Jesus could have made it. Honestly, guys, I really don't. And I'm telling you right now, if that verse said immediately before the tribulation, I've said this before, every pre-tribber would be using that verse. They'd finally have that verse that many of them admit doesn't exist, that says the rapture is before the tribulation. 
In fact, Tim LaHaye says, and I mentioned this recently, Tim LaHaye says uh, in one of his books that this is the second installment of the rapture, immediately after tribulation. Second installment. But I asked Tim, Tim, where is the first installment? You know his book? Look at verse 9 of chapter 24. He says the rapture in his book happens at Matthew 24, 9, the pre-trib rapture. Let's see if we can find it in 24, 9. Let's read it. They will deliver you to, does it say to the clouds, heaven? No, to tribulation. And they will kill you and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. What? Come on, guys. Is that a rapture there? That's the reference he gives. He says the Lord will receive us to himself before that time. And he quotes, he, he references this verse. I'm using that in my debate. I've got a little picture of it ready. Because what he's really meaning right there is, guess what? Tribulation starts there. That's where he wants to believe the rapture is. So he puts it at that verse. That's not the outline Jesus gave us, though, did he? He didn't. Guys, this is scary stuff when you think about it. That's called asegesis, reading into the text rather than exegesis. By the way, I mentioned this verse uh, Wednesday night, but I want you to check something out that I think is really heavy. He says this is when the rapture takes place, but really it's when the tribulation begins. There's no rapture here. The end is not yet. Look at what it says. Then they will deliver you to tribulation. I agree, that's when the tribulation starts. And will kill you. And you will be hated by all nations because of my name. So when the tribulation starts, what's the first thing that happens? They're going to what? Hate us and what? Kill who? Those who have what name? The name of Jesus. Guess what? When the tribulation starts, there shouldn't be anybody left on the planet when that starts that are hated because of the name of Jesus. Because they've all been what, according to pre-trib? Raptured. Do you see the contradiction there? I've seen a lot of clear verses that, that show pre-trib is false, but this one right here, not just because the tribulation, uh, Jesus said they're going to hate you, his, even his apostles if it happened in their times, the apostles of the church, plural, personal, plural pronoun right there, but you're going to be hated right when it starts. Well, guess what? According to pre-trib, the rapture happens, there's no Christians left on the planet. And then, you know, what happens is 144,000 supposedly become evangelists, you know. It doesn't say that. And people get converted and come to Christ and they're hated. But guess what? That's not how Jesus sets it up. Jesus is telling them to prepare for this time. Amen? Amen. And right when it starts, they're going to be persecuted because of the name of Jesus. So it does not fit their scenario. Verse 10, and many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and mislead what? Many. It's going to be a huge deception, guys. Because there's going to be all these people so upset. Where's Jesus? He said he was coming. I can't believe he, he broke his promise. He's a liar. He's evil. You think I'm exaggerating? No. I have all kinds of quotes here that I've gathered uh, last year. Spent probably a day searching out the internet from pre-trib. What pre-trib say, if Jesus doesn't... I just went all over the place reading different articles, different blogs, different forums and stuff. And over and over again, I found pre-tribbers saying, if he doesn't come before the tribulation, he's a liar. He's evil. They're being set up, folks. Verse 11, many false prophets will arise and will mislead what? Many. That's how come many fall away. They fall away because false prophets. There was a time when, it's called the great disappointment in the 1800s, when somebody picked a date. Now, I don't go into detail. I've got a lot of detail on this. You can even look up the great disappointment in Wikipedia. And they picked a date, and it didn't happen. And guess what? All kinds of people were incredibly disappointed. And they succumbed to different cults. Ellen White, who was teaching, you have to keep parts of the Mosaic law to be saved, like the Sabbath and so forth. She, she kind of just took over that movement. Many people followed her. And we're being told by pre-tribs, many of them say when the tribulation starts, there's a different gospel now you have to accept during the tribulation period that's more works-based, that's more law-based. And it's not the same as the gospel we're preaching now, but the Bible says the angel preaches an eternal gospel, amen? And Paul said you preach another gospel, let him be what? Accursed. No, it's only one gospel, the eternal gospel. Any other gospel is false. It's the same message all the way through, guys. It's not a different dispensation when the tribulation starts. Many false prophets will rise and deceive many. There will be huge deceptions at the time. Because lawlessness has increased, most people's love will what? Grow cold. The agape 
of the most. There's a definite article, ha, before that. Those who have the agape, that's Christians. We have the agape. Non-believers don't know the agape love of God. He's warning believers here in a fallen way. That's the context. Verse 13, but the one who endures to the end will what? Be saved. Obviously, the context is spiritually right here. He's talking about falling away from the faith. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And then what will happen? Then the end will come. Therefore, when you, personal, plural, pronoun again, see the abomination of desolation, Peter, James, Paul, Andrew, if it happened in your lifetime, this is incredible. This is incredible. Now, it's incredible to me because the church is definitely not prepared to go through this right now, especially here in America. In fact, we're told if Jesus lets us go through the tribulation, that that's like a husband beating up his bride. It would make Jesus a wife abuser. What in the world are they talking about? All the apostles were killed. Was Jesus an abusive husband to them? Millions of Christians have been martyred. Countless thousands tortured for their faith. Jesus, they confuse flipsis, tribulation, with orge, wrath. We are not appointed to the wrath of God, amen? We're protected through this time. Even Tim LaHaye admits that the believers during the tribulation period that supposedly are left behind and then become believers, that they'll be protected from God's wrath in his study Bible, in his movies, in his book series. So when a pre-tribber says, oh, well, God wouldn't let us go through that because then we'd have to, he'd have to punish us with his wrath. Where does it say that? It says we're not appointed to wrath, amen? And he protects us at that time. Even the gentleman, Dr. Stoffer, who I'll be debating this Sunday, he says that Noah is a picture of the tribulation saint and he was protected by God in the ark from God's wrath and came out on the other side in the ark still on the earth. So he admits that God, that the tribulation saints can be protected from God's wrath. So why in the world would you try to scare people? No, you got to get raptured. Otherwise you'd have to suffer God's wrath. When God's going to protect, they admit all the tribulation saints. Amen? It's not a good argument. It's a very, it's a bad argument. But Chuck Mister says this, very, he's going to be at the conference too. There are people that believe that the rapture will occur at the end of the great tribulation. And that puts the Lord, bridegroom, as he has in, has in parentheses here, in this kind of program. Come, we are going to get married. Then I'm going to beat the living daylight out of you, and then we'll go have dinner. Comfort one another with these words. See what he's trying to do there? In fact, Tim LaHaye says if Jesus doesn't come back before the tribulation, it's not the blessed hope anymore. It's the, remember that one? It's the blasted hope. Is that what Jesus says here? No, if you compare this with Mark 13 and Luke 21, which is the same Olivet Discourse, Jesus said when you see these things begin to take place, look up for your redemption is drawing near. And then he says, when you see the, all these things come to pass, you'll see them, you'll know that I'm at the door. In fact, Seeing these signs during the tribulation period should encourage our, what, hope. Amen? Can I get an amen on that? Amen. All the more. It doesn't blast our hope. In fact, I'll tell you what. Tribulation starts happening. Things start happening. It doesn't make me go, oh, no. He doesn't love me. He's evil. He forgot me. He hates me. I don't even say, whoa, this is exactly what Jesus said, man. Lift up your heads. It's getting close, guys. Amen? If we die, praise God, absent from the body to be present with the Lord, we're going to die anyway. Amen? If we're there and remain until he comes, praise God, we'll be caught up to meet the Lord in the air at his return. Either way, we're going to be with him. Amen? Amen? Now, thank you guys. You helped me get ready for my debate. Okay. <laughs> Think about it now. In fact, uh, I was on Jan Markell's show not a couple, I don't know how many times, and I was told by Eric Barger, love Eric, Eric great guy, and, and uh, Spoke at a couple conferences with him. He's Jan's partner on the radio often. And he told me they want me once a month. Well, then my trailer came out for the rapture on the left behind or left astray. Haven't been invited back since. In fact, I think all our materials left are the submerging church, which they'd bought 1,500 copies or something like that, over 1,000 at least. 
And a lot of fruit was born through that. No more. Can't find them on their website. They don't make them available. I love them still. In fact, we had a link. I, we still might, I don't know, to their, to their website still. Because I don't divide over the issue as far as you're not a brother. You're not a sister if you don't agree with me. Not that they do. But it's interesting, the cold shoulders you could get. And Jan wrote me an article. And she said, or I'm sorry, an email after that trailer came out. She said, I never thought I'd call a brother like you a fool. And she wrote me a few emails and saying, Jesus isn't going to beat up his bride during the tribulation period. And I wrote back to her. I said, this is why we're concerned. I, quoted, I mentioned that Tim LaHaye says, if blessed hope's not before the tribulation, it's a blasted hope. And I was out of the country when she responded saying that I was bearing false witness. Tim LaHaye never said that. Thankfully, Tony had intercepted the email because I think it came to good fight. And he gave the exact quote, which I have documented. I have it in a book in my library that he wrote. And she didn't respond to it after she got it. Did she respond to that? Tony's shaking and said, no. Yeah, he did say that. That's dangerous stuff because you're setting the church up, saying their hope is destroyed if you have to go through this time. When Jesus was concerned that our hope would be destroyed because we wouldn't be ready, so he told us in advance so we wouldn't fall away, amen? This is scary stuff because these are the leaders today in the prophecy movement, many of these people. Wow. In fact, uh, right around that same time, she had a prophecy conference, and she speaks right before this guy that speaks, and this is Ed Hinson uh, speaking. Ed Hinson speaks, and he gives that same thing about the bride. If you go through tribulation, you, you'll have to, you don't play it yet. You, you, that'll be like Jesus beat up his bride. He's scaring his audience. We won't let us go through that time. And the irony is right after, this is just something I found on YouTube, and right after that, you have another guy speaking at the same conference talking about how he was beaten for Jesus and how God used it to purify him. Now, Jesus doesn't beat us but he allows us to go through tribulation. We're not appointed to, to orge his wrath. God's wrath is against the wicked who are unrepentant, amen? Flips this is for all believers. You will have tribulation in the world, Jesus said, and you will be handed over to the tribulation of your life at that time. What's interesting is there seems to be a total contradiction at this conference, and they put the two together. I go, do they realize what they just did? Because the other guy's saying, oh, Jesus wouldn't let us go through that. Then the next guy speaking is talking about how Jesus worked in his life through tribulation. Let's watch this clip. Christ is not the object of the Savior's wrath. The wrath of men, the wrath of Satan, but not the wrath of Jesus. He loved the church, died for the church, and gave himself for the church. Now I'm going to show you a picture, not to offend you, but to make you think. It's an actress, but she's depicting a battered wife. And I want to ask you to look at this picture and ask yourself, is that Jesus' love for the church? Is that his plan for the church? Beat her up! Beat her up! Again and again and again. I say no! A thousand times no! I have too high of a view of the love of Christ for the church of Jesus Christ. He loved her. He died for her. He gave himself for her. And hallelujah, he's coming again to take her home to the Father's house. I'm an Arab. I'm a born again Christian Arab. And I love Israel. Yet I say more. That definitely alienates us from the rest. You see, I tell people to fast forward through my life and the experiences that I'm so humbled to experience with God. I tell people I really, really, really came alive at age 16. See, a young Muslim came to us wanting to learn about Jesus. For two weeks I talked to him about Jesus Christ. I knew there was something special about this young man. He disappeared on me after a couple of weeks and I didn't know what happened to him, but his mom found his Bible under his bed. She took her to his uncle's. She's a very concerned mother, and she was concerned with what she saw inside the Bible. She took the Bible and uh, gave it to his uncle's. For three days, they locked him in his bedroom, and they beat him up over and over. Deny Jesus, deny Jesus, deny Jesus. I kept telling him. Not one single time would he deny Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. He kept telling him, Jesus changed me, Jesus changed me, Jesus changed you. His uncles decided that he's been brainwashed. And they, on the, really the true threat is insane, but the true threat is the people that are evangelizing and sharing Jesus. 
They knew it was me that I was sharing Jesus with them. And I was walking down the church street towards our church in Bethlehem. And seven, I was walking down the street. And there was about six, seven guys standing on both sides of the fence of the street. And one person comes up to me and says, are you Stephen? I said, yes. When I said yes, I felt something burning in the back of my head. And I, I went like this, thinking it's a bug or a fly. And something was itching. And I realized that there was blood. I turned around, and there was these six, seven guys with metal chains and wooden sticks in their hands and put me to the ground, began to beat me over and over and over again. I remember, remember feeling and sensing the chains and the wooden sticks on my body. I said, Lord, if you get me through this, I would love you even more. That's the craziest thought that could ever happen, but that's what happened. Lord, if you get me through this, that's the only thing I knew how to say. Lord, if you get me through this, I will love you even more. When I said that, God be my witness, I felt like a white blanket just covered my body. I felt closer to God than I ever have in my life. While being beaten on the ground by these seven men, I came to the realization and understood the heart of the Father. And when he said, you will be persecuted for my name's sake. When he did say, they will persecute you for my, for, because they persecuted me before you in the Gospel of John. I understood the psalmist when he said, even if I lay my bed in the pit of hell, thou art there with me also. I understood what he was saying. This experience taught me to redeem the time to love others till death. They picked me up and shoved me in this trash, in this trash can, blood coming down my face, beaten on this trash can. They spray paint, look at this Christian, may he be an example. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to say that anybody the disciples, converts, this is their outcome. But you know, today, I have those seven men to thank for the men I am today. If it wasn't for that beating, I would not be standing before you preaching the gospel to hundreds and thousands around the world. If it wasn't for that beating, I would not be here standing up for Jesus Christ. Wow. <laughs> See the contrast there? Now, guys, I don't, I'm like, are they not seeing it? And actually, when I saw that, I read some comments under it, and one of the early comments was, I love your guys' ministry. I want to get the tape for this conference, but do you guys see the contradiction? I don't understand, you know? One saying that won't happen, others, well, guess what? All of us, pre and post, believe that we're not at point of God's wrath. He's not beating anyone. And pre-trib leaders know that we believe that we're not going to be beaten by God's wrath. It's a scare tactic to get you to accept their viewpoint. Look at Farrah Fawcett. Look how bad she got beaten. Jesus not gonna do that church. We don't go through tribulation. <sighs> There's a categorical error going on there. Huge. This guy's beaten. He loved Jesus all the more. God used it to give him opportunity. Guess what? You know, it's a great picture of the church in the Song of Solomon. Almost uh, all pre-trib leaders admit that's a picture that the bride there, that Solomon's a picture of the groom and the bride is a picture of the church. You know what's interesting about that? In chapter 3, she's so in love with her bridegroom. But in chapter 5, like the ten virgins, man, she gets sleepy. And the groom comes knocking on her door. Hey! She hears his voice. Reminds me of the ten virgins when there's ten and they fall asleep, right? And five wake up, but five wake up, but they have no oil. And they get shut out of the kingdom of God. There's no second chance. And you know what's heavy about that passage? Is the five that had oil went in, but they still dozed off. You know what's heavy? Think about this. In chapter five, he's knocking. Let me in. Open up. She doesn't. She's rolling around in bed. Tired. I'm tired. She's indifferent. Just like the church is getting right now. Not so excited about Jesus anymore. And you know what? He leaves. Doesn't come in at that time. Whoa. Then guess what happens? She starts, Where, where's my beloved? Where is he? She leaves. She's looking for him. She's wandering the streets. Does anyone see my beloved? And guess what? His bride gets beaten up, it says, by the watchman. Not by the bridegroom. He doesn't beat us. She gets beaten up. And it's after she gets beaten up that she starts longing for her bridegroom. Now she really misses him. Tribulation worketh hope. And she starts saying, has anyone seen my bridegroom, my beloved? And then the Jews are like, what's so special about your beloved beyond our beloved? And she starts witnessing about her beloved. And it's this incredible, beautiful statement about how awesome her beloved is, a picture of Jesus. And in Semitic poetry, you don't have all these renditions about how beautiful the groom is. It's always about the bride. 
That's because this is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And it's when the church goes through tribulation that some of the church will wake up. And we'll start testifying to the Jews of how beautiful Jesus is. And our mission, one of the missions in the tribulation period is to make them jealous. The Bible says in Romans 11 that we're to make them jealous. What's so special about your bridegroom? And she tells them, you get it? Church is going to be aroused and, and proclaim. That's awesome, man. The Lord, I believe, hit me with that like a ton of bricks, man. What was going on there? I'm like, wow. And the church is going to testify about Jesus. But some will never, never have oil because they're being told, you don't got to be ready to go through these things. And they'll be indifferent. And then when the Lord doesn't come when they expected him to, they'll say, oh, the Lord delays it by his coming. What happened? We won't have to say that. We'll say, hey, you know what? This is exactly what he said would happen first. But pre-tribs will be like, he's supposed to come. The end was supposed to be here. What happened? And hearts will grow cold. The love of many will grow cold. And lawlessness will increase. Many will fall away. But he endures the end. will be saved. Amen? Now, it's interesting because the view I'm sharing with you is not the most popular view, by the way. You can't write books like Left Behind because most people don't want to hear it in these days. They will turn their ears away from sound teaching, it says in the last days, and they'll heap themselves. Many teachers will tickle the ears and tell them what they want to hear. Okay? And don't get me wrong, I believe there's many people who accepted pre-trib from the church they went to. They inherited their theology from a seminary. They never really checked it out. And they love Jesus, but they've been deceived in this area. Is that true of all the different hearts? I, I, let, I leave that before God, but I have to speak the truth in these days. But I'll tell you what, Jesus said in Luke chapter 17, there's going to come a time when you think you're going to see one of the days of the Son of Man. You think you're going to see it, and it's not going to happen like that, he said. At that time, watch out for false prophets. In other words, guess what? He predicted the church would be thinking they're going to see him when they're not the end. That's in Luke 17. That's in Luke 17 around verse uh, 22 or so. And then he says, you know, he goes on to talk about when I come back, he said, it'll be like lightning shining from the east to the west. It's not a secret rapture. It's going to be visible. And he says, even as it happened the days of Lot on the same day, not seven years earlier, the same day Lot was taken out of Sodom, God rained fire and brimstone on Sodom, he said, it'll be the same when the Son of Man returns. And he says, one will be taken and one will be left and goes on. It's the same day, guys, not seven years earlier. And I'm telling you right now, listen to some of these quotes that I've just gleaned. This is just spending a day searching articles, things. Listen to this, what people are saying if the rapture isn't pre-trib. One poster, it's like the blasted hope thing. The rapture is our blessed hope. I could not hope or wish for anything less if I thought for one second that there would be no pre-tribulation rapture or that we'd be going through the tribulation, he says, then I'd have to call God a liar. Jesus is a liar, and much of the Bible is a lie. See what people are being set up for, guys? Paul, Marti Paul and Martinez. The Bible clearly states that the believers, she says, uh, will have the Holy Spirit within us, and the Bible also clearly states that the time of the seven-year tribulation, the restraint of the Holy Spirit will be removed from the earth. Are you saying that Jesus lied to the believers? The Bible never says the Holy Spirit will leave the earth. In fact, the testimony of Jesus, the spirit of prophecy, it says during the tribulation period, the two witnesses prophesy, that's a gift of the Spirit. Jesus said, don't premeditate what you say when they bring you before kings during the tribulation period, because the Holy Spirit will give you utterance. Mark 13. Here's another example of a pre-tribber saying that Jesus is wrong then. Many scoffers say it's an escapist view. You bet it is. And if Jesus is to beat his bride, the church, to death before the wedding, then that's not the Jesus I know. Most believers will be martyred to death during the tribulation. Even the first half is bad enough. Well, look what's happened to hundreds of millions of Christians through the years, guys, and all over parts of the planet right now with ISIS killing Christians. Does that mean that Jesus is a liar, that he doesn't love us? No. He told us those things would happen, but he told us he wouldn't allow us to go through more than we were able to handle, amen, and that he'd be with us when we go through these things, and I'm with you always, even to the end of the age, amen? This was written to me personally under our trailer, I think, uh, Nathaniel Jones. 
If this is true, then why does he protect, heal, provide, and love me now? Just to abandon me and forsake me for seven years. He never says he'll abandon us. False conclusion, but when you say the Holy Spirit leaves the earth, false, that's the wrong teaching. I thought that God said he would never forsake me. He did, he won't. This makes God a mean, hateful, forsaking liar. See what's going on here, guys? Sounds more like Satan to me. So God's the devil if we have to go through the tribulation. See what's being planted in their brains. As for me, I just love Jesus and his holy word and what he says he will, that he says he'll deliver me. I pray for you, Joe. Don't be deceived. He loves you too. A lot of these people are sincere, but sincerely wrong. Another lady left a post on our Good Fight Facebook site stating, if the rapture is not pre-trib, then Jesus died in vain. Wow. Paul said if he didn't rise from the dead, you know, our faith is in vain, but not if we have to go through tribulation. Another writes, uh, states that, uh, well, it makes God a liar since God is absolute and eternal. That would make him, by pure logic, an absolute and eternal liar, meaning none of his promises are real. See, their hope gets blasted because they've been deceived. Another blogger called Churchianity, not Christianity, writes, people rage on and on about the rapture debate, but I don't think there's a debate about the rapture at all. Our God says there is an escape from all. Either it's true or God is a liar. I'm trying, I'm, I'm quoting it upon quote, a quote. Some of you see, I'm just not picking one or two random people. This is a thought throughout much of the church. These are people that are actually writing. How many people are thinking it? Victor writes, God is not that vicious. <laughs> and he goes on, it's a longer quote, so I won't read the whole thing. Chrissy Decker says, a loving God would not leave his followers to suffer the extreme horrifics of the last days. No before time, which is a strange title for this person. I do have a reason for believing in the pre-trib rapture. It is because I do not believe a loving God would put his bride through such a terrible thing as the tribulation. You guys do recognize in Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 14, John sees a great multitude that no one can number from every nation, people, and tongue, and, and kindred. And he says they come out of the great tribulation. In other words, they went through it. They're cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. And, and John's like weeping because he doesn't know who these are. And or no, he's not weeping at that point. He's weeping in, John, in Revelation chapter 5. And the angel, or the elder tells him, hey, you know, these are they that come out of the great tribulation who have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Does Jesus not love all these hundreds of millions of Christians that you can't even number that go through the tribulation period? Is he partial? No, that's us if we're alive at that time. Another writes, a loving God, oh, I'm sorry, I write this. <laughs> a loving God allowed his son to be crucified to save millions of lost people, Amen. A lot of apostles to be mar martyred and tortured and so forth. The apostle Paul prepared the church, it says in Acts 14, 22, confirming the souls of the disciples and admonishing or exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. Jesus described going through the tribulation period and told them they would see all these things if they were alive at that time. And then he warned them not to be drunk and all these things. And he says, pray that you would have the strength to escape all these things and stand before the Son of Man. The context is escape from falling away. Because the coming of the Son of Man is a few verses before that, immediately after the tribulation. And the Greek word there for escape is ekfugo. And it's interesting because ekfugo used in Luke and that's the only place we see Jesus says that about praying, right? That you may be able to escape all these things and stand before the Son of Man. Ek fugo is used only there. And that word ek fugo is not in the passive voice, like you're escaping because you're raptured and some other force is acting upon you and you're just passive. It's in the active force. I'm sorry, the active voice. In other words, you're the one escaping so you'll have the strength to endure those things. And that word ek fugo is only used two other times by Luke, who wrote it, used it in Luke 21. It's used in the book of Acts when Luke writes about Paul escaping and Silas being able to escape from prison. It's having to be some, in something before you get out of it. And then Paul, uh, I'm sorry, then the seven sons of Sceva trying to cast out demons and then being beat up by the demoniac and then escaping his house. It's about being in there before you what? 
come out. And I say that this because the man I'm, the gentleman I'm debating, Doug Stoffer, Sunday, when it comes to being prepared in Luke 21, 36 about praying and so forth, he says this, I do not pray that prayer. No, children, no Christian should be praying that prayer, this prayer. Why? Because he doesn't believe we need to be ready. And that we're looking forward to the second coming and the signs because he believes there's a coming before that. And in 1 John, Thessalonians 5.10, Paul talks about in 1 Thessalonians 4 how the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we were alive, we caught up to meet him in the air, amen? And he says in 5.10, whether we are asleep, meaning it's his metaphor for death, those who sleep, he says, I want to be concerned, troubled about those who are asleep in Jesus, those who died. In verse 10, he says, whether we are alive or whether we sleep, we're supposed to comfort one another with these words. He's going to rapture us, amen? But he says the word sleep there refers to spiritual sleep. You're not walking with the Lord anymore. And he says, whether you're walking with the Lord or not, you'll still be raptured in the end. And that, when you look at what Jesus said about being ready for his return, that terrifies me. Say so you don't have to pray as he said to pray about being ready for him and standing before the Son of Man, that you don't have to be walking with him spiritually. You could be asleep like the ten virgins and you'll still be raptured. Pray for me because I want to communicate and speak the truth in love. Amen? But I have to speak the truth. The context there is, he says to put on the, the helmet of salvation, which is the hope of Christ's return and, and being ready so we're not overcome by the day of the Lord, meaning his day of wrath at the very end of the tribulation. For you yourselves know perfectly well that the day of the Lord so comes, Paul says, as a thief in the night, for while they're saying peace and safety, sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon women with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, not in darkness, that that day shall overcome you as a thief. For you are children of light, children of day. He says, he admonishes them to watch, be sober-minded. That's what we have to be. We have to be watchful and awake, not asleep. That's the context of that passage. So when people are being told you could be asleep at that time, that's very serious stuff. It's the opposite of what the scriptures teach. In fact, some of my biggest concerns about pre-trib is it doesn't have the people watching for the signs of his return. They're not, they're not watching the way Jesus commanded to watch. They're not preparing the church the way they're supposed to be prepared. They're also teaching you get a second chance after you miss the coming of the Lord. That's, a, that's what the tree left behind series is a lot about. People come to Christ. Oh, the rapture happened. So you know what a lot of people are doing right now? Oh, well, guess what? If I miss the rapture, then I'll get right with Jesus. But guess what? You miss the rapture, there's no more chance. That's it. Boom, door's shut. After the five virgins come in, he shuts the door, and the other five knocks, they let us in. Jesus says, too late. So it teaches a second chance to the non-believer who's waiting for the rapture so he can get right with God to see if it's true. That's serious stuff too. It ends up saying the Lord delays his coming because he didn't come when you thought he was gonna because you thought he was coming pre-trib when he never said it. And what happened when Moses, which is a picture of Christ, ascends the Mount Sinai and he goes to get the Ten Commandments and it says when they saw that he delayed his coming, what did they do? They built a golden calf and the church has been expecting Jesus sooner than he said he was going to come. He says you're going to think you're going to see one of the days of the Son of Man. It's not going to happen like that. You know, the church is becoming more and more idolatrous instead of realizing we're supposed to be looking for the signs that herald his coming and the door will be shut. Ruth Graham, Billy Graham's wife, wrote this letter to David, uh, Dave McPherson, who, Dave McPherson, who I interview in our Left Behind Left Stray series. Listen to what she wrote. The news from around the world of Christians suffering unbelievably is bound to make a pre-trib or do some serious thinking. She says, of course, I am sure they would say that the tribulation they have undergone is nothing to be compared to the great tribulation, and they may be right. However, I'd rather prepare myself to go through the tribulation and be happily surprised by an unexpected rapture than expect to be raptured only to find myself going through tribulation. Perhaps not a very scholarly way of approaching the problem, but true nonetheless. She writes, I was talking recently with an elderly missionary from China who told me that her greatest regrets now are not having prepared the Chinese Christians for the tribulation they would undergo. They suffered greatly. Millions were slaughtered under Chairman Mao. She said that her years in China, she went everywhere teaching the pre-tribulation rapture and getting Christians to believe that they would not have to suffer for the Lord in that sense. The great tribulation may absolutely stagger the imagination, but still there's only so much a person can suffer. 
Wow. Corey Ten Boom. How many of you read The Hiding Place or saw the movie The Hiding Place? Good number of you. True story. She, she and her family hid Jews from the Nazis during the Holocaust. She was sent to a concentration camp with her sister Anne. Anne, Anne died in the concentration camp as well as her parents. And listen to what she writes. Listen to what Corey Ten Boom writes. Because she suffered and she realized the church isn't ready to suffer. She says, there are some among us teaching there will be no tribulation, that the Christians will be able to escape all this. These are the false teachers that Jesus was warning us to expect in the latter days. Now, I don't say all these guys are false teachers, but guess what? It is a false teaching. In China, the Christians were told, don't worry, before tribulation comes, you'll be translated raptured. Then came a terrible persecution. Millions of Christians were tortured to death. Later, I heard a bishop from China say, sadly, we have failed. We should have made the people strong for persecution rather than telling them that Jesus would come first. Tell the people how to be strong in times of persecution, how to stand when the tribulation comes, to stand and not faint. In America, churches sing, let the congregation escape tribulation. But in China and Africa, the tribulation has already arrived. This last year alone, more than 200,000 Christians have been martyred in Africa. I know I've been there. We need to think about when we sit down in our nice houses with our nice clothes and eat our steak dinners. Many, many members of the body of Christ are being tortured to death at this very moment, yet we continue to write on as though we are all going to escape the tribulation. It's sad when the men are preaching escapism and you have the women are standing up saying we need to be ready. Women and men of God, we all need to take a stand, amen? Amen. She says, since I have already gone through prison for Jesus' sake, and since I met that bishop in China, now every time I read a good Bible text, I think, hey, I can use that in time of tribulation. Then I write it down and learn it by heart. That's an awesome lady, man. She says, hey, she went through the Holocaust and barely lived. And she's saying, I know to be ready for what's coming and prepare others for it. Are you doing that, mothers, fathers? with your children. Jeremiah said they're going to go through a 70-year tribulation. Judah and Hananiah, whose name means the grace of God, says, no, it's not going to happen. And he told the people, and Jeremiah, remember he had the yoke? He carried it and said, 70 years we're going to the Babylon. And by the way, it's a picture of the tribulation. We know that because of what happened with Nebuchadnezzar when they did go to Babylon. It's a picture of the Antichrist. We know that because there's over 40 allusions to the book of Jeremiah in the book of Revelation. It's a picture of the tribulation. And he went before Hananiah and the people saying, we're going through it. Hannah and I took that yoke and off of Jeremiah, threw it down broken and said, thus saith the Lord, we're not going to be going through that. In fact, they already started. Some of them, their nobles were already taken. Their artisans were already taken into captivity right at that point. It's around 28, chapter 28 of Jeremiah. It's already going on. And people are still being deceived at that point. And Jeremiah said, if a prophet prophesies peace, he'll only be known if that comes to pass. But everybody that prophesied before you, the prophets that prophesied before you prophesied of desolations and wars. Then God has him turn back to Hananiah. And he tells Hananiah, you've made my people believe a lie that they're not going to go through that time. That's what he's talking about. And you've counseled my children in rebellion. You look at John Hannah's words, how did he do that? He wasn't saying go after Moloch's and the Baals like some of the other false prophets. He just got the timing messed up. And that's all it took for people to want to rebel against God when that time happened. Do you see what's going on in that picture? Come on, man. It's huge. That's why there's going to be a huge falling away, guys. We just had the men's retreat last weekend. And I had another event similar to the trip with Kenny and Jim because I went mountain biking, mountain biking with Bob Hedge and John Heber, who can go for miles and miles and miles. They could be like on the Olympic mountain biking team, you know, as far as I'm concerned. And they're like, sure, you want to go? It's 1,500 feet up. And I've lost like 30 pounds, but I've got like 30 more to go or so. And I'm like, I want to go, yeah. It's 1,500 feet up, okay. No air to breathe. <gasps> In the heat of the day, we're leaving at 12.30. But guess what? They tell me what it's going to be like. It's going to be really hard. Not a, not a walk in the park. I'm prepared. We go up the first two mountains. are like, <sighs> and I'm told by Mark Hunter, 
don't worry after the second mountain. It's the kingdom of God. I know because I know the map. I've really looked at it a little more. I've been up there. I've driven up there. I know he's a false prophet at that point. Okay, no. It's going to get maybe easier, but not that much easier for me anyway. Mark's not a false prophet. He's a great brother. Illustration here. I get past those two mountains, and it's hard. But guess what? I have other brothers that know it's going to be hard. I've got brothers pushing me on their bike up the hill, and I'm just like, kind of embarrassed. Like, no, I don't need that. I'm a stud. No, I don't need that. But no, I don't say that. I'm like, oh, I'm like, I got it. But there it is. I'm like, okay, I'll get pushed a little bit. Why not? Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> then Mark, where are you, Mark, with the motorcycle right over here? All of a sudden, he zooms out his motorcycle. He's got a motorcycle. I'm like, no, he's got it good, you know? I want the motorcycle during the tribulation, bro. I want one just like that. Enduro, 750, was it? Uh, 690. 690. Nice bike, man. He's pushing me up. I'm like, at certain points, I'm like, this is good. We all run out of, we're running out of water. Chris Knight comes up with Nick Panera, a couple of the brothers. They got all kinds of water. Praise God. God is good. It's hard, but he's good. He loves us. He's not beating us. The mosquitoes, I don't blame God, whatever. <laughs> all of a sudden, man, I got another mile uphill before it's downhill. And even the downhill was hard for me, man. It was blessing though. It's great. Last mile, last half a mile, brother comes, hey, I'll ride your bike for a little bit. Can I ride? Your... I get in his car. Whew, God's good. You know, I go down and now it's hike a bike. It's all kinds of stuff. I flip my bike over the handlebars on pure granite rock. It just missed falling off a cliff. Thank God I had my helmet on. Sometimes I don't wear it because I, I hit that first. Bam. So that's kind of cuts on each limb. It's okay. I'm like, praise the Lord. This is fun though. I knew it was coming. I'm dying, but it's fun. John Hebrews give me power bars. John B Bob Hedge keeps giving me pep talks and encouraging me, you know. He sees me, I'll just flip over the boulder. Yeah, go ahead first. And he looks, he looks at me, looks away, and he's, later he goes, I was to get between you and the ground <laughs> 25 feet down, I think it was. <laughs> he couldn't have got there. And John keeps giving me encouraging talks and, and Mark and all these guys, you know. Not Mark Hunter. He was the false prophet in the scenario. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, guys. Well, there's a lot of things that happened during that trip that are memorable. You know what? The trip is my trip with Kenny, and that trip were two of my funnest trips ever. That one wouldn't have been fun, though, if I fell away. The first one. Many will. Our deliverance came at the end. Both of them weren't done until they were done. And I'll tell you what, I look at it as God's providence, by the way, in my life to allow these two trips back to back at this time in my life. One I was more ready for. Amen? Be ready. You know what the scriptures say. Amen? I know I've gone very late, but, you know, I've been in men's retreat. I was in Carolina doing a wedding. I'm gone next week, so I'm going to get some time in. Amen. And I'm done pretty much right now. But you get it, Right? We'll put this on two CDs because I know we went over about 10, 15 minutes, but it'll also be on the internet. And if you use the iPod or whatever, you'll be able to hear the whole message in one setting. But I encourage you, pass this message out, amen? Listen to it once in a while. There's a lot more that could be said on how the Lord is coming back for a bride that's been purified during tribulation, the scriptures teach. And guess what? In the end, he has his bride with him, and it's been those who've endured to the end who loved him and have proven their love, amen? Because we're not just the bride. We're the church militant, man. We're ambassadors. We're firemen. There's a bunch of metaphors used. They force just one metaphor, and then they twist the meaning there, okay? I want to encourage you. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on his word. Watch for the signs that herald is coming. Be prepared, and God is always good. He's never a liar. He's always true to his word, and he's always good and perfect, and his, his plans for us are good. Yay and, and amen, amen. In fact, he says that to those going into Babylon, that he is good, that he's prepared a future for us, a good future, not, a, not, not for calamity, but for welfare, amen, to give us a hope and a good end, amen? Let's praise God. Give glory to God. He's worthy. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah, Lord. We love you. We praise you. We worship you. We exalt you. And I want to encourage you. We're back on Sundays, our Wednesdays, going through Revelation again. When I get back, we started a few weeks back. And uh, that's a really appropriate book as we pass out the cup and the bread right now. Let's please stand. Let's try to pass it out quick because I feel bad for the nursery workers. I haven't gone this long in a long time.
Matt and Andrew, raise your hands over there. There was John Brooks' brothers or sons, and they were at the men's retreat leading worship with Doug. It was such a beautiful time, and John used to go to our fellowship years ago. Make sure you say hi to them. And yes, I want to get together, you guys, when I get back from the men's retreat. I mean, uh, back from the debate, amen? So we'll set up a time. Uh, but they were like five years old when you guys were in this fellowship and before they moved. And they came, drove all the way out here, went to the men's retreat, and here they are in the fellowship. And we wish you guys could all move back, but it's just great to see you guys. Praise God. They love Jesus. Are you guys still pre-trib, by the way, after that message? <laughs> no, they, they weren't pre-trib, man. They were, they were brought up in the Word. Amen. God is good. Amen? Amen? I love you guys. Lord loves you guys. He's good. Kenny knows I loved him. Love him through that whole thing, too. <laughs> I felt so bad about that, Kenny. But he forgave me. Thank God. Father God, we thank you so much for the bread and for the cup. We thank you for the, the precious heart of Jesus and your heart, Father, that you so loved us that you sent, you gave your only begotten Son, that whoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We pray, Father, regarding the terrorist attack or whatever kind of attack that was that happened today, the people that are still alive, that they'd make choices to know you, Father, to seek you through this time and, and get right with Jesus, Father. We pray that you would forgive us all of our sins. If anybody here doesn't know Jesus, we thank you that you're a good God, Lord, and we pray, Father, that you would open their hearts. Open your heart right now because the Bible says, as many as received him, he gave the right to become the children of God. He knocks on your heart, and if you open it up, he'll come in and sup with you. If you put your trust in Jesus, you'll pass from death to life. You will not be appointed God's wrath now or forevermore. If you have faith in Jesus, he died for your sins and rose again and conquered death. It's the good news. Father, we thank you for the bread, which represents his body. We partake of it with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Oh, how precious is the blood of Jesus, Father. Jesus, we thank you for washing away our sins. Our sins were as crimson, were dark before you, but you've made us white as snow through faith in your son's blood. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your shed blood on the cross, your great love for us. You love your bride. You always will, even when we go through hard times and don't understand what we go through. But we do understand that you are sovereign, you are all-knowing, that you are good, that you never make mistakes, and we will, may we never doubt you. In Jesus' name, we partake of the cup with thanksgiving. Amen. So next Sunday, prepare for a really good service with Steve preaching. And then after that, there'll be... A, you know, pizza passed out, come right back in and watch, and I'd love you to watch the debate.